Hello again and welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson. With me today, B.J. Clark. We're always grateful for the opportunity to get together to study the Bible, today being no exception. We're going to be talking today about what constitutes New Testament worship. Please stay tuned. B.J., great to be with you today. Good to be with you, Mike. B.J., we want, we want to talk a little bit today about what constitutes New Testament worship. Now, there are a lot of folks in the world today that engage in, quote-unquote, worship. But there's a vast difference in what people in the world consider worship and what the Bible says. So how do you begin countering those that have the idea that it really doesn't matter how you worship as long as you're just, you know, sincere, honest, and have a desire to, to, to come before the Almighty God. Yeah. Jesus addressed that same concept when he said, uh, God is spirit, and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I think of Colossians 3.17 on the heels of that, where Paul would write by inspiration that uh, what, whatever we do in word or deed, we do all in the name uh, by the authority of the Lord right. Jesus. And so there's our regulation right there for worship is to do it in spirit and in truth. What is truth? The word, John 17, 17. And that's how we know if we're doing it according to his name, if we're following the standard that he gave us for worship. Absolutely, and, that, and that's, that's the goal. B.J., you know, in John chapter 4, verse 24, the passage you referenced a moment ago, when Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him, you think it's possible that in the minds of many today, there are misconceptions about coming to worship? From that vantage, and from the vantage point of, we have the idea that we're the audience, but but really, God is the audience. We're the participants or the assembly. Worship is to be directed to God. And it's not so much man-centered as is, as is to be God-centered. Right. In fact, I heard a preacher one time say worship is a verb. It's not like an event that we watch. It's something we do. And we are involved in worshiping God uh, as we see the pattern for it. And you know, Paul would address some people in Acts 17 who didn't know what they were worshiping. He says, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They had a description to the unknown God. Paul says, you need to know who that God is because he's the one that deserves your worship. And he says, I'm going to declare him to you. And then we read about people uh, worshiping God in vain in Jesus' own statement in Matthew right. 15. And so even religious people can worship God in a way that's not acceptable in his sight. Well, you know, in Colossians 2, Paul talks about will worship. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that here's somebody who's, who is catering to their own whims when it comes to worship. B.J., as we talk about God being the object or the aim of our worship, isn't there a certain amount of decorum dignity or respect that ought to accompany our worship. For example, back in Exodus chapter 3, when God instructed Moses to remove his sandals, he said, because the ground wherein you're standing is holy ground. I don't think that he was saying to Moses that the desert at that point in time was a holy place, but he was in the presence of a holy God. And so that's true today, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I was thinking about the fact that uh, God is the one that we worship. And so wherever God is, is a place that certainly, and God is everywhere. And so worship is something that we can do anywhere if we do it in the right manner, in the right spirit. And so in the Old Testament, when you see people bowing before God, such as at the uh, occasion at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, when the Baal priests were trying to get their God to respond. And Elijah just calmly calls on the one true God who sends the fire from heaven, consumes the sacrifice. The Bible then talks about how 
they all fell down and bowed and acknowledged the Lord. He is the God, the Lord. He is the God. So that reverential attitude begins with knowing we're worshiping the right one. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter six, when Isaiah caught a glimpse Mm -hmm. of the second member of the Godhead on his throne, and he said that he was high and lifted up. That's the one before, before whom we come. And then those angelic beings, the seraphim, they were crying out one to another saying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. As a result of that, Isaiah, recognizing his own sinful disposition, Mm -hmm. said, woe is me, I'm undone. Don't you think that when we come into the presence of God, we need to understand we're not in the presence of an equal, but rather we are before the holy God. Absolutely. In the Psalms, in 29 and verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And then it says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This is the very thing you were just noting from Isaiah's mentality in Isaiah chapter 6. He saw the holiness of God. It made him want to worship. And I think about the apostle Peter too, who in Luke chapter 5 was faced with the reality of who Jesus really was when They had toiled all night and tried to get a catch, and they weren't able to get one. And then Jesus told them to uh, cast their nets uh, into the deep uh, and uh, let their nets down. And Simon said, Master, we've toiled all night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And when they did that, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Their net actually broke. But it's the reaction of this afterwards that I find very fascinating. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. He thought he wasn't worthy to be in the presence of such a great man. And yet, of course, Jesus was going to reassure him and tell him, Don't be afraid. You're going to catch men from now on. And so Jesus lets him know, even though I'm God, I want a relationship with you. Tremendous example. Yeah. It really is. BJ, back in the Psalms, in Psalm 89, verse 7, the psalmist said, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints, to be had in reverence by all them that are about him. Is it possible that when we come together to worship, that we forget we're not at a ball game? Right. This isn't a concert. We're not to be focused on the people around us, but rather all eyes are to be in the direction of the Lord. Yes, I think we, that's what's wrong with so much of the religious world's idea of worship. They have to have their choral groups, their choirs, their praise teams, their, what this does is basically make them the entertainers that we've come to watch while basically we sit and watch the show. And that's not what God ever intended, as you noted earlier at the beginning of the program. Worship is not about me spectating. It's about me meditating and thinking personally and, and closely about God and worshiping Him as He's directed. And so, yes, worship is not a carnival and therefore, it shouldn't be carnal. It should That's be spiritual. Great point. B.J., in Hebrews chapter 13, the writer talks about offering God the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise. When we sing to God, we're singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord, but there are also byproducts, or rather, I guess we would say, there are also dividends to be enjoyed by those who are participating because, as Paul said, we sing and admonish one another. A lot of teaching takes place in our song service. I love to hear the singing that is done. And so often I've gotten in the habit to help me meditate and keep my mind on what I'm singing. I think of verses. I know I'm not the only one that does this. I think of verses that are the background for what I'm singing because uh, spiritual songs are based on this book right here. In fact, think of so many songs that we sing almost are verbatim Uh, repetitions of things that are in the Word of God. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, and uh, on and on we could go with that. And so, yes, uh, the book of Psalms is one of man's favorite books to read. If you think about it, 
Uh, of the 39 Old Testament books that were inspired, all of them were, which one of the 39 do most Bible publishers choose to put at the as an appendix after the New Testament as a bonus book? Psalms. Psalms. Why? Because it is a pouring out of men's heart to God in song. Absolutely. And it touches the heart. And Psalm 23 is a famous psalm for a reason, uh, not just because it's in the book, but because of the inspired words that go with it, and it touches the strings of the heart. Well, it does. Psalm 23 is a great example. Psalm 148 about praising the Lord. Those songs that have been psalms that have been set to music, and and you know, I just think about how blessed I've been through the years to sing these songs, and I think really it's somewhat of a foretaste of heaven. Yeah. When you hear the beautiful rhythm that. You, you've got people that are blending their voices together in rhythmic melody. It's it's directed to God, but then we're also beneficiaries, and that's a wonderful blessing. Some of the best services I've ever been to were ones where the singing was already so motivating and moving because everyone was putting their heart into it. It's easier to stand up and preach after oh, you've heard that kind of singing than the kind of singing that is basically dragging along in such a way that you think, is this ever, ever going <laughs> to end? And even those moments, we have to focus and concentrate on what we're doing and maintain worship no matter what the leader does and how good he is or isn't. But bottom line is you get singing as a part of worship and make it an important part and match it up with the songs and the sermons, yes. and those things can all move together to blend and make a wonderful without, service. Without question. You know, one of the preachers that you and I both appreciated and loved in days gone by, Tom Holland. Yeah. Brother Holland used to say that good singing can make a, a sermon great. He yeah. said, but bad singing can <laughs> kill it, you know. And so, so you know, we want to do our best. Now, we're not saying that our worship is performance-driven. No. But rather, we're giving God the reverence that he is rightfully due. Matter of fact, the word worship means to kiss towards, right. uh, giving God uh, the homage, the adoration that he is due. B.J., one of the things that's unique to churches of Christ, most churches of Christ, we do not use any type of mechanical instrument. We don't have choruses or choirs or anything like that. It's not because we don't like musical instruments, but rather it's because the Bible legislates us to sing. Right. So how do you counter those that will sometimes say, well, you know, I really don't think that using an instrument is really that big a deal. Mm -hmm. How do you counter that? You began this program by calling it a study of New Testament worship. And there's a reason why that New Testament part needs to be emphasized. Because if you go just by the New Testament under which we live today, because the Testament is a force after men are dead right. and Jesus died, and that's when his New Testament came into force. If you get into a discussion today with someone and ask them to justify the mechanical, the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship, I promise you, they're going to race and bypass the New Testament to hurry to the Old Testament to try to find justification for it. Now, you and I just mentioned that Psalms has value, but we also know it was written for our learning, right. not for our law, Romans 15, 4. We don't worship the same way they did in the book of Psalms. We do not worship the same way that they did in the patriarchal age, the Mosaic age. We worship the same God, but under different standard that he is given. And the standard is given us this, for us is the New Testament. That's right. And that being the case, the, we ask, where is the New Testament passage that would show New Testament Christians on earth singing praise to God with the accompaniment of mechanical instruments of music? We find Ephesians 5, which says, make melody in your heart. And we do not find any example in fact, even those who are religious denominational founders knew this, admitted this, and many of them were vehemently opposed to the mechanical instruments of music and 
the use of their churches question. As because they knew they were never used by the first century church. Well, did instruments vanish off the face of the planet between Malachi and Matthew? No. What happened to all of them? Why weren't they used in the New Testament? Well, did animals vanish off the face of the planet between Malachi and Acts 2 and thereafter? No. What happened? Animal sacrifices were once authorized by God. That's right. But the New Testament has no provision for animal sacrifices. It's not authorized. Same thing with the music. Once authorized, no longer authorized. True. You know, B.J., one of the great examples in terms of worship, going back to the period of the patriarchs, Cain and Abel. Both of those boys offered sacrifice to God. And the Bible says that God had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. There was a difference there. So what was the difference? Right. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. Well, how does that's Hebrews 11.4. But how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Therefore, that's Romans 10.17. Put them together, and here's what you have. Abel offered his sacrifice in accordance with God's Word. Cain did not. Consequently, Abel's offering was accepted. Cain's was rejected. May I point out, they were both worshiping the same God. That's right. But worshiping one correctly, the other incorrectly. Therefore, it's not enough to have the right object of worship. The right manner of worship also makes a difference. Yeah, you triggered a thought in my mind, BJ. You know, over in 1 John chapter 3, sometimes the Bible is its own best commentary. You Amen. mentioned Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah. In 1 John chapter 3, here's what, John said, verse 11, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. Well, Cain did take the life of Abel. But then he asked this question, and why did he murder him? Because his works were evil mm -hmm. and his brother's righteous. Now, if you want a commentary on will worship, there it is, yeah. and the end result. For, for people that say, well, you know, it's really not that big of a deal, or I don't think it's a salvation issue. Look, you need to go back and read what the Bible says. What the Bible says about Cain, his works were evil. Mm -hmm. God didn't bless him because what he, what he offered him was correct. Ask Nadab and Abihu if how we worship God matters or does not matter. There was a man who wrote a book some years ago uh, in which he was yeah. talking about the church being in transition, and this man was going to show up at a, a Christian college. And so my father and I went, along with some others, uh, just to ask some questions and to try to be kind but inquisitive about what he was really saying and how sure. far he was trying to take us. Because in his book, he said, the things that matter are like the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and how we worship is not an uh, internal matter, it's an external matter. It's not a matter that really, really matters. It's, he came right out and said these things in his book. So when I was given an opportunity to go to the microphone, I asked in a very nice way, as a Christian should, I called him by his name and I said, Brother, in your book you say that how we worship God is not a matter that matters. It's not an internal matter. It's an external matter. I'm just wondering if Nadab and Abihu were here tonight and huh. they were to read that in your book, what would they say? And he said, Nadab and Abihu are dead. And the crowd actually laughed a little <laughs> bit and I think they saw the point, yes. And why? Why did they die? Now, obviously, they would have been dead of old age, if, but why did they die when they died? Because according to Scripture, Leviticus 10 and verse 2, right. they offered a fire which the Lord had not commanded, which the Lord had not authorized. That's exactly right. And therefore, God took their life. Tell me God does not care about the details regarding worship. Well, I think He does a, care. Absolutely, without question, without question. B.J., one of the other components of New Testament worship has to do with the Lord's Supper. And we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. I know that there are some religious bodies that partake of the Lord's Supper maybe semi-annually, maybe quarterly. But what does the Bible teach about 
the significance of this memorial feast. Acts 20 and verse 7 says, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, and this is not breaking bread for a common meal, this is the actual Lord's Supper in the context there. Well, why, why was the first day of the week such a meaningful day? It's the day upon which our Lord arose. You can read about that in Matthew 28. And it's the day upon which the church was established, Acts chapter 2. And so on that first day of the week, which was different than the Old Testament Sabbath day, it was a first day of the week, New Testament day, thus showing again the difference between the Testaments and the way we worship. And so they worshiped on the first day of the week. Well, someone might say, well, it doesn't say that uh, they worshiped every Sunday and took the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And so some churches now argue uh, we take it once a quarter, we take it once a year, because we don't want to do it so regularly that it becomes like a rut or a routine. Look, some of these same churches give every week, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so what about this idea of upon the first day of the week? If you go to the bank and you ask to take out a loan, the loan officer says, I've got good news. Your loan has been approved your payments will be due on the 15th of the month. Are you going to look at your wife and say, did you hear that, honey? He said 15th of the month, singular. I distinctly heard month in the singular. Therefore, we, which month do we, do we just choose a month? He's going to say, um, <laughs> I don't think you understand the 15th of the month phraseology. Yeah, It means any month that has a 15th day, and guess what? They all do. They all do is a month when your payment is expected. All right? Any week that has a first day, and they all do, uh -huh. is a day when your observance of the Lord's Supper is expected. And the early church did observe it on a weekly basis. Man came along later and messed a lot of things up in worship, and that's one of the things he started neglecting what God said about the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. Well, that's so true. You know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, you have the components of New Testament worship right there, particularly in reference to the Lord's Supper as well. B.J., in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks about men lifting up holy hands and praying. And, of course, I think the reference there has to do with corporate worship. It has become somewhat of a fad now for women to be used in a more expanded role mm -hmm. in worship. Some are now waiting on the Lord's table. Some may be presiding at the Lord's table. Others are reading Scripture publicly. And then there are some who are, are, are now even preaching or teaching in a, in a mixed assembly. So how do you counter that trend mm -hmm. when that doesn't constitute New Testament worship? Well, if I respect what the author of the New Testament said, I'm going to respect what he said about who leads in the prayers. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 4, when it says, who will have all men to be saved, the word men there is a word that we're familiar with. Anthropology is the study of man. Anthropos, a form of that is the Greek word used here to refer. And so that could be male or female. God died to save a male or female, both male and female. But you get down to verse number Eight, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's not the same word. This is a word that signifies the actual male himself. The gender matters to God. And then he mentions women, and women are valuable. Yes, they, are, they profess godliness, but they are told in verse 11 to learn in silence with all subjection. Now, you and I didn't write this. Who did? God did, through Paul. And someone tell me one day, they said, well, Paul was just having a bad day when he wrote that. Paul said, the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. And that passage, by the way, comes three verses after he didn't join the women there to keep silence in that particular context. This is not anti-women. Jesus didn't choose a single female apostle, and there are no elders in the church that were uh, females. The point being, God has the right to decide how he wants it done, and it's our obligation to respect his wishes and oh, wow. to do it exactly the way he said to do it, because 
He is God, and he's the one being worshipped. Well, you know, in that context, you know, some say, well, it was cultural. Well, Paul said Adam was formed first, then Eve. Right. That's not cultural. It takes it out of culture and takes it back to creation. It, it does. And, you know, you mentioned something about women serving as elders or uh, this whole concept. And I know that there are some today that have gotten on board and are ordaining elders. But I just don't know how uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 fits that criterion. Because if I understand what the Bible says, an elder is to be the husband of one wife. Right. So that seems to negate that. It would if you go by the gender language that the Scripture uses without trying to modify it. Sadly, some are trying to argue today, yeah, but, you know, today women can marry women, and therefore you can, and one of them might call themselves the husband. But see, that's taking it out of the realm of the reality of Scripture and putting it into the realm of, basically human opinion and thinks so. God knows what he wants, and there's never been a church that I've been associated with that hasn't been strongly helped by the hardworking women of the congregation. Absolutely. Jesus himself had women who ministered to his needs when it came to his uh, work as a preacher, and uh, so they're vital. But that doesn't mean that they can do everything that anyone else can do. You and I cannot do everything that someone else can do in certain areas because we're not authorized. That's it right. doesn't make us inferior human beings. That's right. BJ, we've got about a minute left. What would a person need to do to become a New Testament Christian? Go to the New Testament and find out what it says. The New Testament says that we've all sinned. We come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. And the wages of that sin is death, Romans six twenty three. But there's a way out. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, First Timothy 1, 15. And we can be saved by doing what he asked. What did he ask? He said that uh, faith in him is important. If you believe not that I am, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. And that faith is produced by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then Jesus on one occasion said, except you repent, you'll perish. And repentance is necessary, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confession with the mouth is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. I'm baptized into Christ to put him on, Galatians 3.27. That's when the blood of Christ washes my sins away and puts me in the church of Christ, Acts 2.47. And then I live for him until I get to live with him. Wonderful thought. BJ, as always, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of our audience today. God bless you.